Let's get into 1.6. Today's essential question is how is deductive reasoning different from inductive reasoning? At the end of today's lesson, you'll be able to use deductive reasoning to draw conclusions. I've got a couple things for you to consider on the right hand side of the screen. If you're watching this on YouTube and you're not doing it with a class, just think about those before you move on. Pause the video if you would like. And then on the bottom of the screen, I have the law of detachment and that is a very important law that we're going to be using throughout this lesson. The law of detachment simply is a law of logic that states if a conditional statement and its hypothesis are true, then its conclusion is also true. So what we have here is if P implies Q and P are true, then Q is true. And that sounds a lot like what we did in our last video, but now instead of looking at P, and Q to be true, to see if P implies Q is true, we're gonna look at our hypothesis and see if our um, implication's true to make a determine on what our conclusion will be. So here's kind of our thought process here. This is setting it up algebraically. If Alicia scores 85 or greater on her test is in blue because that's what we use for our hypothesis color, then she will earn an A as her final grade. That green is our conclusion. And what we're actually doing this time is a little bit different than what we did the last time. We need to see what the law of detachment tells us one more time is P and P implies Q are true. Then Q is true. So here. For P to be true, her score must be greater than 85. So we're going to automatically set that up for our hypothesis because we know that to be true automatically. And we know after that last video, we only want to concentrate on um, looking at the truth table if our hypothesis is true. So we're really just going to ignore those last two rows. And then we have to look at now what we're trying to do is say that if P implies Q is true, right? Because now we only have two options, true or false. If we pick true here, just like in the last video when we went down the lane, they have to feed into each other that way. But now instead of this arrow right here pointing to the right, what we're actually doing is saying if I can check both of these to be true, then this one also must be true. That is the law of detachment on this table. So let's look at it again. Or let's look at this next line in our explanation. Here's where things change. We no longer make a judgment based on the val truth value of Q. We are looking at the results that determine the conclusion. So since we know she scored an 89 and our if was true, now that our P implies Q is true, or that she did score higher than an 85, we can now say that she will in fact earn her A as her final grade, which is what we had in the green. So let's talk about a real world example that's pretty easy to work with. And I'm doing that because there's a few things I really wanna highlight before we move on. So our conditional is if I wake up after 5.30 a.m., then I will forget my breakfast. In our first scenario, I wake up at 4.30 a.m., what can we logically conclude from this conditional? Well, since 4.30 is before 5.30, then I will not forget my breakfast. Scenario two is if I wake up at 5.45 a.m., which is after 5.30, then I will forget my breakfast. So scenario one, we remember our breakfast because it's before 5.30. And in scenario two, it is after 5.30, so we will have forgotten our breakfast when we leave the house that day. Now, what we can't say is what do we plan to have for breakfast or what was the meal that we forgot about or what is the meal we brought with us? We can never add information that's not given. We can't add any assumptions, which would then modify our hypothesis. So we have to be careful with that. We can only work with exactly what we had. So if we were taking a quiz or test on this and I ask you scenario three, I wake up at 5.15 a.m. Did I have cereal with a banana? 
And for that one, we cannot answer it because I've added the cereal and banana when it doesn't actually pertain to our problem. What you can tell me though, is if we got up at 5.15 a.m. that we will remember our breakfast, but we cannot make any statement at all about what our breakfast was or would have been. So be very careful not to add information. Our next slide is really gonna show the importance of not adding information, but also being very critical about the way we assess the information that we're given. So let's look at that. And you're gonna be a little bit more familiar with this one. This is talking about grades. The grading system that I'm modeling here is based on our school's grading policy. So this is all true. So I'm going to let you know that since this is true, that's one of our givens, that our grading system here is the same as our schools and you're familiar with it, we can move on to speeding this up just a little bit. But what we do have here is a compound conditional statement and let me show you what I mean by that this right here and this right here means that if this first one fails for the law of detachment we're gonna move on to the second one test that information against what we have and if that fails then we're going to go on to this third one and if that fails we don't have anything else available to us, so we really can't make any other determination. So one thing I'm always going to do is read the question or read the conditionals one by one. And now that we're using numbers, I'm going to try and represent these mathematically or algebraically for this type of problem. So my first conditional is if you score below 60% on the test, then you'll receive an F. So we're talking about scores, right? So I'm going to use S for the score. So for this one, S is less than 60%, then we get an F. Now notice I did not say less than or equal to because our next conditional says between, which is an inclusive term for whatever it is talking about specifically. So now my next one is if S, oops, that's the word, if S is between two numbers, 60% or 69.4% inclusive, because it can go up to 69.4, then we get a D. And then for our third one, I'm going to move to the right-hand side of the screen, and it's another compound inequality with a word that is inclusive, the word between. So I'm going to say if S is between 89.4 and 100, well, that's 89.5 and 100, then we score an A. Let me make that a little nicer. So I'm going to present some scenarios once I fix my messy four over five over four. So this is just says again, if 89.5 is less, or if S is greater than 89.5 and S is less than 100, then we get an A. So in scenario one, you score a 93 on the test. What we have to do here, just for now, because we're getting into it, is take our S value. So in this scenario, S equals 93 and we have to test it against our conditionals. So if I plug in 93 here, is 93 less than 60? No. So now that P and P implies Q are not true, we can say that Q is not true or that we will not receive an F. So right now we know that we're not getting an F. Now we're going to plug in 93 for here. And 93 is definitely greater than 60. So we have our first true part. But again, because this is inclusive, both pieces must be satisfied. And is 93 less than 69.4? Absolutely not. So we can now say we have also not earned a D. And now if I come to here, I have 89.5 
and 93. 93 is definitely greater than that, so that's true. And 93 is less than 100. So since this is a true statement, we can now say that we will earn an A because of our 93. Scenario two, you score 69.4% on the test. What is your grade? So I'm gonna erase my 93s. And we're gonna look at that a little bit more closely. And let's put it in blue. So now I have S equals 69.4. And if I plug in 69.4 up here, 60 is definitely not greater than 69.4, so I know I don't have an S, an F. Now if I plug in my new 69.4 here, 69.4 is greater than or equal to 60 is definitely true. And then 69.4 is less than or equal to 69.4 is also true. So here we can say that we've earned a D. Now, scenario three, you score a 73% on the test. What is your grade? I want you to think about that one before you answer it. And I know we're watching it on a video, but if you had an instant reaction to that question, or if you had an answer for it immediately, I want you to question that answer before I say anything else. And the reason I'm asking you to question the answer is because none of our inequalities addresses what happens between 69.4 and 89.5. There is a dead spot there for our information. We have nothing between those two numbers. For any value S here, we cannot conclude anything. Now, yes, we are using the school's grading system, but for the three conditionals we were given, this leaves us with nothing to conclude. All right, scenario four. You missed the test and your absence is unexcused. What is your grade? Well, we have no conditional statement. We have no given, no assumption about the school's absence makeup policy. Maybe you are allowed to make up a test if your absence is unexcused. It may be at the teacher's discretion. Nothing is said at all about any part of missing the test, whether it is excused or unexcused. So we really have nothing to say here at all. And I've left this bottom part up the entire time. It says we can only work with what we are given. And I put that in blue because that is our hypothesis. Be careful to not add information or prior experience when evaluating these statements. For scenario three, we know in this course that a 93% is an A. At the University of Tampa in the education courses, a 93% is a very low B. A 96 is the cutoff for an A. So, Different institutions have different policies, so we can only use the information that we're given. At the University of Tampa and the College of Social Science, Mathematics, and Education, a 73% is failing in all education courses. So even though I did not give you any information about the 73% range for our problem, I'm just trying to bring to light that every institution sets its own standards so let's go over, we have done, we have made this evaluation correct for an A grade, the D grade, and for sure we do not know for these two. So now that we've kind of chained together looking at a series of conditional statements, we're going to learn a new law. We've, we've just covered the law of detachment. We're going to kind of slowly ease into this new law, and it's going to be where we take a series of conditional statements that were arrived at through inductive reasoning. And then we're going to learn a trick to streamline them and make predictions in a much more efficient manner. So on the screen right now, I have a series, what is it? Five conditional statements. So here's the whole idea behind it. 
Suppose you are asked to observe your sibling's morning routine every day for six months. The following pattern emerges. This means that your sibling does the exact same thing every day or that every time this chain of events has happened, they've always gone in the same order. So if they wake up when their first alarm goes off, then they always wear a blue shirt. If they wear a blue shirt, then they have cereal for breakfast. And if they have cereal for breakfast, then they ride the bus. And if they ride the bus, then they arrive to school on time. And if they arrive to school on time, they are addressed for being out of uniform. So one thing I want to point out here is if you look at each of these conditionals, whatever my conclusion was on a line became the hypothesis of the next line. Cereal for breakfast was the conclusion, right? They put on a blue shirt. That meant they were having cereal for breakfast. And then it meant if they had cereal for breakfast, they would ride the bus. And if they rode the bus, they arrived to school on time. And if they arrived to school on time, they are addressed for being out of uniform. Why? Because they wore a blue shirt and our colors are garnet and gold. So we can see how waking up when their first alarm goes off every time leads to this series of events where they are addressed for being out of uniform upon arrival to the school. But that's a lot to say, right? We have six months of data to back this up. It follows the same exact pattern every time they wake up when their first alarm goes off, they put on the blue shirt. The blue shirt means they have cereal for breakfast. Having cereal for breakfast means they've ridden the bus. Riding the bus means they arrive to school on time. And for this chain of events, when they arrive to school on time, they are addressed for being out of uniform. So let's look at a new little wall here. Well, this is kind of to show you again. Here's our P and our Q. Our Q became our new hypothesis and we had a new conclusion. That conclusion became our new hypothesis again. And we ended up with a new conclusion, which then became our new hypothesis which generated a new conclusion, which then became our new hypothesis, which generated our final conclusion. But using inductive reasoning to develop these conditional statements, we will assume that they are all true, and therefore P implies Q is true, Q implies R is true, R implies S is true, S implies T is true, and T implies U is true through inductive reasoning and observation. So there's something we can do here to simplify all of this. We can say that if P implies Q, which implies R, which implies S, which implies T is all true, then we can also say that the implication of U is true. So the simplified version of this, and you'll notice that the Q's that aren't repeated, the R's aren't repeated in this is, if they wake up when their first alarm goes off, if they wear a blue shirt, if they have cereal for breakfast, if they ride the bus, if they arrive to school on time, then they are dressed for being out of uniform. And this is why I use my grouping symbol, my parentheses. You have all these if, 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 all of this here are our if statements, our hypothesis. This is a chain of hypotheses that leads to a conclusion. And that conclusion is they're being they're being addressed for being out of uniform. So what we can now do is cut out what I call the middlemen. All of this redundant stuff, our P to Q, our Q to R, our R to S, our S to T, our T to U, and we can just simply say that P implies U is true. Anytime we have a hypothesis that becomes the conclusion, and then that new conclusion becomes a hypothesis for the next conditional statement, we can cut out all of those middle things and just say that P implies the final piece, the final conclusion is true. So if they ask you to summarize your siblings' habits in the morning, you can tell them if they wake up when their first alarm goes off, then they're gonna be addressed for being out of uniform. And you've done this on observation and you've studied the behavior and you've noticed this is always the case. So you can assume safely 
that P implies U, which is they will be out of uniform if their alarm goes off. And then we can put that into the truth table and see if that conditional is always true. Now, if every day when their alarm goes off, and when they wake up when their first alarm goes off and they're dress coded, P implies U is true. Your counter example is gonna be the very first day they wake up when their first alarm goes off and they're not addressed for being out of uniform. Then you have to go back and look at your series of events to see where it broke down and you can no longer use this new rule. So let's look at the law of syllogism really quick. The law of syllogism is a law of logic that states that given two true conditionals with a conclusion of the first being the hypothesis of the second, there exists a third true conditional having the hypothesis of the first and the conclusion of the second. And then we have this little if then statement here. And it's just saying that if P implies Q and Q implies R are true, then we can cut out the Q's and just say the R's are true. So this is our first hypothesis. This is our first conclusion. And that conclusion then became our second hypothesis, which then arrived at, or through that, we arrived at a second conclusion. So now we can just say that our hypothesis one implies our second conclusion. And now we've cut out some of the data. And since we arrived at this through inductive reasoning, we can now use the law of syllogism to make this more efficient. So let's look at this in practice. Assume that the set of conditionals is true. What can you conclude about using the law of syllogism? So what we're kind of giving you permission to do right now is go ahead and assume P implies Q, Q implies R is true. We've already shown you how to do these things. So now we're gonna let you have some freedom here and just automatically assume they're true so that we can use the law of syllogism. So for part A, if Kenji plays the trumpet, then he plays a brass instrument. If he plays a brass instrument, he is a member of the part marching band. So we have, here is our hypothesis one. Here's our conclusion one which then becomes hypothesis two, which then leads to conclusion two. Now, since conclusion one and hypothesis two are the same thing, we're gonna give them a variable and we're just gonna make that Q out of pure convenience. And now we can say that Q is equal to Q but they played very different roles in our conditionals. In our first conditional, Q is a conclusion. In our second conditional, it's a hypothesis. So to apply the law of syllogism, determine whether the conclusion of one statement is the hypothesis of the other statement. Well, we've already shown that to be true. We assign Q to that statement, and then we've shown that one of them is a conclusion and one of them is a hypothesis. They color-coded it for you here, and you can see these two are definitely the exact same thing. And if you wrote this part out, you'll have P implies Q, which then implies R, which means we can cut the middle out and leave it as P implies R. And then if we come back up here, the green is the R and the blue is our P and we have exactly what we said we would have through the law of syllogism. We don't need to say that he plays a brass instrument. We can just now say that if he plays the trumpet, he is a member of the marching band. And for our recap, I'll just reread our deductive reasoning main points. What we learned today were the law of detachment and the law of syllogism. Starting with the law of detachment, if a conditional statement and its hypothesis are true, then its conclusion is also true. So if P implies Q and P are true, 
then we can show Q is true. One of the nice things about using the truth table earlier on is that we see when P implies Q is true only or is true when P and Q are true. So we can go ahead and say, yes, that makes perfect sense that those are locked together in that situation. Now let's look at P implies Q and Q implies R being able to be simplified to P implies R one more time. And we're going to start by reading this. Given the two true conditionals with the conclusion of the first being the hypothesis of the second, there exists a, true, a third true conditional having the hypothesis of the first and conclusion of the second. So if P implies Q and then Q implies R are both true, since these are the same, then we can cut those out and go straight to P implies R being true.